Hi guys, this is Seamus and Emelyn again with another update on the reactivity that we've been working through. Um, today we focused more on trying to get that muzzle off. So fart started uh, first with the muzzle on in both situations with on the bed and uh, at the heel and in a down position um, and then having Kevin knock on the door and come in. What you can see through the video is First we start on muzzle and then slowly uh, work up with intensity and then as we take that muzzle off, we go right back down to super low casual Kevin just kind of walking in, not really saying anything but just that little slight handshake and a little hug and using that reactor or rewarding for no reaction um, obviously to that and then slowly building our intensity up in terms of exaggeration ending with that really big explosive hello and handshake and really big hug to kind of exaggerate that stuff. So uh, working to that point, um, we've been able to get her desensitized with being off muzzle, not going 100% right away and kind of pushing her those limits. We um, were able to kind of work our way slowly up with that intensity um, to prevent, you know, the probability of that reaction. Uh, obviously, when we don't have a reaction, we're going and rewarding heavily for that. So you can see I'm giving her a couple little handfuls of the kibble as well when I'm rewarding um, to let her know that that's something that we really want to reinforce that behavior um, to kind of counteract that reactivity. Hey, Kevin. Hey, how about them browns? Yeah. Yeah. Good girl. Alright, uh, one more time we'll do this on um, off muscle though. Actually, yeah. Um, this time we'll go slow builder way up. So come in, still not come in, just calm handshake, hug. We won't really like do much talking, and then we'll go from there. This time we'll have a little bit more conversation, greeting, but let's exaggerate the handshake like we did last time, but the hug will just be casual like that. Hey, Kev. Hey, what's going on, James? Good. You can see she's like getting paint. This time, we'll go for it. Okay. Hey, what's going on? Hey, good see you, man. Good yeah. see you. All right. Good girl. Good job. Emmy, come. Down. Good. Uh, now, this time, I want it just super low again, right? Because we're going off muzzle. Um, just slow again, no, no talking or anything. Just a simple, just handshake hug. This is something I can talk about too, a little bit after how we build up. Down. 
Okay, come. Down. Good. All right. Um, this time, conversation, but still low body stuff. Hey, Kev. Thanks for not mine. Good to see you, bud. Good. Good job, Amy. Now this time we'll do exaggerated, keep the volume kind of the same, but exaggerated handshake, maybe it was able to tap for the hog. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kev. Hey, congratulations. Yeah. Good. What's going on, man? Hey, buddy, good to see you. All right. Woo! Let's go, girl. Good job. Let's go, girl. Okay. Okay, but you maybe want to see if, like, don't, don't, you don't need to, like, call her over to you, but maybe if you, like, crowd shot or something, see if she'll kind of, like, walk over to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, you, can just kind of, you can give her a little, like, pet, too, if you want. If she was, if she walked over to you, yeah. I want to kind of see, like, show that after that desensitizing, that there is still a possibility of engagement as well, right? Hey, good girl. Oh, you're such a sweetie. Nice. Nice. Right, perfect. Cool. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> good girl. Buddy, are you giving mom a hard time? So, the crate training um, had been interesting, you said. Yeah, yeah, how has... Well, I got a better one, so that was good. He pawed, so I was, I was hopeful at first, because he, he pawed for a second, mm -hmm. shocked him at 50, mm -hmm. he immediately stopped, laid down, got quiet. So yeah. It was great. And then he whimpered pretty much the entire time, very quietly. Sure. But within 10 minutes, pooped. So mm -hmm. I had to go in, move him, clean him, bring him back in. Yeah. Um, he also pees within the first few minutes. Sure. He only does it once. Mm -hmm. He'll pee and he'll poop, mm -hmm. and then I can get him to stay there for... I've left him in there for about an hour. Okay. And then I'll go, just mainly because I'm so cold in my garage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go back inside. Sure. And then I've left him in the crate for maybe four hours. Okay. Like while I'm in the house, I'm yeah. walking around and stuff. And nice. He's, he whimpers the entire time. Yeah. But so nothing to where it's worth shopping for. Exactly. Um, like. So that's where we're at. Yeah, yeah. So a lot, still a lot of the crate anxiety, getting used to the confinement aspect yes. of it. Um, Likely, like we talked about last week, it just takes some time. I'd definitely like him to start calming down in the crate. The whimpering, like again, we wouldn't correct for. As far as eating and drinking, do you feel like you have a good schedule for him? Um, so it's gonna change because if my life was how I'd like it to be, yeah. I'd be going to the gym still. Sure. And I usually go in the morning, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I already get up at 4.30 in the morning. Yeah. I don't have 30 minutes to go piss around trying to get Yes. Before I go at 4 a.m. Okay. So I've been feeding them around 8 or 9, but okay. ideally, I don't know if I should feed them before or after. It seems like once I feed him, mm -hmm. within 30 minutes, he can typically go to the bathroom. Yeah. So it's almost like it helps push it out. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if it's better to feed him, sure. feed him than create him. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot to yeah. very early. In the morning. Exactly. So I'd hold, like you've been doing it, hold off on feeding him so you can go to the gym. When you come home, he can eat because anything in his digestive tract is just going to make it move and he's going to be in a crate. You're going to come home to a very poopy and pee crate. 
a lot of pooping and peeing in the crate, as you've described it, where we've given him ample time to go outside, is anxiety induced. Yeah. So he's just like, I'm confined. I'm just going to let my bladder and poop go. Yeah. Um, and it will take a little bit of time. We're going to keep chipping away at it. We're going to keep doing it. I know it's really frustrating. And I wish that I could like give you a magical answer and him start to get better. But we need to look at like feeding schedule pretty closely. I don't want to withhold water from him by any means and have him have a lot of water out. But you said he was on a medication that made him drink more. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, and the, yeah. And the other thing too is, I learned, is that um, he never lets it all out. I know that's more of a boy thing. He's like always got to have some of that. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, Mister. So he's just been real spoiled the last month because I, I really have not spent any time away from him except yeah. for when I dropped him on my mom's yeah. the weekend. Yeah. So, you know, me trying to get back into a gym schedule or mm-hmm. hopefully mm-hmm. eventually going back to the office for eight, nine hours a day mm-hmm. is going to be a huge change. But yeah. I just, I, because he's peeing and pooping immediately. Exactly. Yeah. And I get the concern with that, but I'd start, like you said, you left for four hours or so, or you didn't leave, but you were in the house. He was okay. in the crate and I was there. Yeah. We could, we'll continue to create him while we're home, but I don't want you to be afraid and feel like you're a prisoner of your own home because you can't leave. Yes. If you feel like he's secure in the crate, um, a side effect just for the time being is we might see a little bit of accident in the crate. Mm-hmm. Um, but I definitely think you should start to push leaving and going somewhere, even if it's just to get a cup of coffee. Yeah. If you're concerned about his barking um, and we're not there yet and you feel like you have to be there to physically give him a correction, we could consider a bark collar in the crate, which I've done with my own dog because we live in, I used to live in an apartment and yes. my landlord was like, she can't be doing that or you have to leave. Yeah. And if it came down to those options, I'm gonna use the bark collar for a little bit and it's just a learning process. It wasn't meant to be necessarily very long term, but it helped me so much. Okay. And that would just kind of activate as he were barking. It's coming from confinement anxiety where obviously he feels very uncomfortable in a crate being left alone. Um, not an issue, I mean, it's a very common issue that people deal with. And I know when I was in the boat, I was like ready to get rid of my dog almost. <laughs> Because I would have her out and I'd watch her pee and poop and then she'd come in and I'd leave and I'd be like, I have nothing to worry about. And I'd come home and she's like covered in her own poop and it was very frustrating, yeah. but it did take a couple of weeks for me to start to see relief. I did the double crate trick uh-huh. and I think really monitoring when we feed him. Um, I don't want to limit his water right now, especially with the medication, but being cognizant of when he's drinking that water. Yeah. Too much energy. I'm trying to fight some of the dogs. Hmm. Yeah. Well, he. What happened was when he got dropped off, there was like a wolf, whatever, shepherd, whatever, and they kind of got into it when I was. I didn't have control of the dog, but yeah. the lady was taken in, like kind of like walked over to the other dog and they started like going at it. Interesting. So, yeah. At daycare, he went after the dog and calmed down. And another dog came in and started trying to like you know play. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like enough of him. So they put him. Put him in daycare, or put him in his own room. Yeah. How long has he been going there for? Uh, well, he hasn't been in a while. Um, he's probably been going for three, three and a half years. Oh, wow. We mm-hmm. usually board them. Like, yeah, yeah. Town. So he doesn't like go to daycare that often. So. Gotcha. Has he ever had issues there before? Um, they've told him he gets too excited sometimes. Gotcha. It's not the first time. Understood. Yeah, I wouldn't be super concerned about it. I mean, in a lot of cases, I mean... You know, it's hard sometimes piecing together what actually happened in those situations yeah. because, you know, again, it, you know, it sounds like you've been using them for a while and they've been good to you guys and stuff, which is good. Um, but a lot of them just, you know, I hear like, oh, he has too much energy, so we put him in a timeout or things like that from other people. And it's like, like that's, <laughs> like, for, first off, like in the dog world, a timeout doesn't really exist, right? A timeout only works if you could, like, rationalize to the dog, this is why you're being put in a timeout and think about what you did like you would with a human and stuff, yeah. which you can't really do to a dog, obviously. 
Um, so we'll see a lot of places with dogs with a lot of energy where what really needs to happen is that they just need to tell the dog to like knock the energy down like a couple of notches, yeah. right? Should, but, we, should I brought his collar for that? Or? No, because that's the thing, right? So it, it you know, the, they wouldn't even know what to do with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they're not trainers, right? They're right. they're daycare operators, which is fine, right? Again, um, there's plenty of dogs that do fine in that environment and stuff like that. But the second there's any sort of like issue or again, arousal levels are too much and stuff like that, they tend to resort to a lot of micromanaging like timeouts and like, you know, trying to separate dogs and things like that, which actually kind of shoots themselves in the foot because it kind of makes it worse, right? You're constantly pulling them away from the things they want to get to, you know? So. Whatever, you know, we, we'll get, I mean, we get so many dogs. We had a dog recently here and he was going to this daycare around the corner uh, from here. And it's like, whatever, it's like a little dog park daycare kind of situation. And the dog did a whole board and train here. He was here for four weeks and was the most social butterfly in the world. Yeah. Like literally, like he was so good, it was ridiculous. Um, and the, the two days after he went home, this guy took him to this daycare, right? To go like socialize or yeah. something like that. And they called him like halfway through the day and said like he needed to come pick up the dog because the dog was like acting aggressively and yeah. trying to bite the staff and the owners and stuff like that. And it's just like, this dog, there's no there's no way, you know what I mean? And it's because they were misinterpreting what they were seeing, right? They didn't understand the behavior well enough. Yeah. So it kind of put a bad mark on the dog, but the dog was really fine, you know what I mean? So in a situation like that, you know, could he have been a little too rambunctious or a little too wild or something like that? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's always that possibility, yeah. but you know, it very well may have been a case of just misinterpreted behavior. Yeah, I you saw know, the, I saw because I handed her the dog. I yeah. Her and then like, I was like walking away and like she kind of just had him out like this and like the yeah, dog yeah. was kind of like standing like by Sally and they like they looked at each other. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'm like the little stare down. Yeah. Then yeah. Like, one of yeah. those things where they look back really close to each other's faces. Yeah, and a lot of that is, you know, we talk about the on-leash greetings, right? And like why on-leash greetings are, are so counterproductive for dogs, you know, is because that kind of buildup of like the stare down with another dog and we're in this like close proximity area and stuff like that, you know, they tend to want to create distance by reacting like that. So whatever, long story short, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about it. So they look relatively okay with that. None of it is, is terrible by any means. Again, Gunner's really thrown off being up here, you could tell. And I think some of his mistakes are messing up Sally a little bit. Yeah. Um, these drills with both of them together is gonna be something that's gonna be important to start working on, obviously. Um, just because, just teaching them to work together as a unit and go through all these motions will help get their attention more on you and off of each other. Because you could tell in some of the, the reps where they were messing up, it's like Gunner would do it right yeah. Sally would do it wrong, and then uh, yeah, and then and then Gunner would think it's wrong because Sally wasn't doing the same thing as him, right? So as they get more confident in it individually while working with each other, you'll see that get less and less. Obviously, um, there was very, very, very minimal e-collar use for any of this. I wasn't even really tapping at all during when yeah. you were just working it. It was just for the food, right? Um, <clears throat> so I would recommend doing some sessions of this just with some treats, you know work some beds, work some comms, work some sits, you know, and just get them really in the groove of doing it and try to get their motivation up a little bit with it. That's why I started adding those rewards in for this because it's not a matter of they don't know it, it's just a matter of just re-solidifying it because it's a different picture, right? This is where we talk about the generalization process of things. You know, they both did this when they were doing their individual lessons perfectly by themselves, mm -hmm. right? But that extra dynamic of them doing it together is just confusing. So we got to get some, uh, yeah, I see that. He said, I'm not sleeping from the baby stuff either. Um, but that'll be a big thing to start working on. Okay. So, and then in our next session, what we're going to do is I want to do a field trip with them 
I think I mentioned that last session or the session before. Yeah, we'll take them to Home Depot around the corner and we'll do both of them for that. And that'll be really good because uh, we'll really be able to test the distractions and all of the individual commands and stuff. But I'd like to see this stuff look, uh, look pretty good at home for you. So spend some time with that. Additionally, next time you come, if you have a bag of treats that they really like, bring it with you because we're gonna use them a lot probably on our uh, field trip as well. So the come command is one thing. Go come and, and do you find that you're having issues with it primarily when you're just doing training sessions, like you're calling her off of a bed or something, or is it when she's just free hanging out like in the yard, in the house? When we went to train her, because usually Maggie, uh, my son, mm -hmm. you know, he, I, I think she sees him as the alpha, really. Sure. Because he, you know, he's pretty strong, he's, he's very, sure. you know, and then she follows. Yep. And, uh, but she, my husband, I mean, she is more trouble with him. Yeah, your husband, you said? <laughs> yep. So I would say my husband, like, I need to let her, uh, you know, come to him and then on his lap. Sure. And he's like, okay, and then I said, no, because it's just, you know, yeah. so she gets confused. Okay. So, um, but another thing uh, is like, uh, she she won't go in the car by herself. She okay. Won't, so, Maria, uh, you know, he, she had me put her in the, in the, in the, um, in the tray, mm -hmm. in the car, and then he said, mom, you know, I just, <laughs> I just recorded her not coming in. She just, then when we did it, when you did it last time, mm -hmm. Uh, she just went in. Yep. <laughs> you know, and then never for us. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I took her for the, you know, the doctor. Yeah. And uh, we took her to my mom's, and then she just won't go out. She won't get in the car? No. Okay. But, we uh, can look at that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? Yeah, so, so my question, the main question is how to teach her to, let's say, like, she's with me, like, mm -hmm. and we're walking, no? And then she's just walking. Very, very rarely she pulls, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, but we're walking and, uh, and then she, when, when I stop, then she just lay down Yep. and she won't get up. Mm -hmm. And then I just like, so then what is the command? Come? Or because she's mm -hmm. already with me. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, good question. So you, what you're saying is, so you're walking with her here and then when you come to a stop, mm -hmm. you said she'll lay down like that. But then when you start walking, she'll stay there? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so one of our rules we have, kind of exceptions to repeating commands, is that if I'm walking, come, and she's in a come command, and I come to a stop, I could repeat the come command when I start moving again, right? So I could tell her, come, and then start walking, uh, right? And that reminds her that we're still moving now, right? Okay. And the reason for that is because if I came to a stop, and let's say I was stopping having a conversation with my neighbor or something like that for 10 minutes, five minutes, something like that, at some point she's probably going to think she's in a down stay, right? Yeah, that, I think that's what she's she probably just thinks like, oh, I'm, I should just stay here right now, yes. right? So to be fair to her, even though technically she's still in the come command, yeah. I'll tell her come again to let her know, come, that we're walking again. Mm -hmm. Does that answer that question? Yeah, I think so. I just hope that she does it. Yeah. Well, why wouldn't she do yeah. it? <laughs> <clears throat> right? So any of these things, right, it's not a matter of hoping that she does it. It's a matter of enforcing it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Let's say I, I asked her to get on bed. I said, bed, right? And, you know, obviously I hope she does it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if she doesn't do it, that's why we trained her, right? Oh, it's right. so that we can enforce it, right? We could yeah. back it up, yes. right? So let's say same situation, come. Let's say I'm walking with her, right, and I stop, and she lays down, mm -hmm. and I tell her, come, and obviously she's getting up and walking with me, but let's say she didn't, right, let's say she stayed there, right, and I'm walking, do, 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 and she's not coming, right, okay. I would say, no, come. I tried to give her off her a tree, the distance, mm -hmm. not get her, I had to pick her up to get her in the, yeah. in the car. Yeah, so a lot of that kind of stuff, especially if we have a dog that like, you know, whatever has a history of being resistant getting into a vehicle or we'll see it a lot with stairs or things like that, is just the commitment behind getting her in, right? And it just takes a couple times of it. And what I find is that, okay, with a lot of people, right? Let's say she didn't want to get onto this bed right now because we see that a lot with dogs sometimes. Obviously she's doing it, right? But some people, let's say getting off of the bed, right? She was resistant of doing it. A lot of people will go, come on, come on, come on. And they'll do this, right? Where it's like, I'm trying, but I'm not really too committed to it, right? She's obviously staying there. She's fighting that tension. Really it's just, 
actually committing, you know what I mean? And just getting her going once or twice with it. Right. And, and I'll show you how to do that here in a minute. We'll take her outside, right? Uh, but committing to getting her in and just using that leash. And uh, usually after a couple of repetitions of that, it's it's not a problem. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, we were having problems with like, she'll listen to, you know, she'll, we'll say we'll put her, put her, you know, say down. She'll mm -hmm. stay down for a minute and then we'll go up way, you know, whatever, and then, then she'll, she'll go away, then all of a sudden she's at your side again, and <laughs> like down, and then, sure. then she'll stay, but so she doesn't, she's not staying, but she's, she's, yep. she's obeying like half of the time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and listen, these are all very normal things, you know, for yeah. first, or two week kind of now, but you know, yeah. first follow up session. And a lot of it comes down to how, like I was kind of explaining before you walked in, how we're enforcing these things, right? You know, training I always say isn't so much about like we trained the dog and the dog just listens. Now training is the communication system of clear expectations and then clear ways to reinforce those expectations. So let's take something like a downstay, like you were saying, like she has a hard time with that sometimes. I'm gonna go take her and I'm gonna put her right over here. I'll put her right there into a down. And because that's kind of a weird spot, she hesitated on it. I told her, no, I have an ability to reinforce and get her into that position. And we're just gonna leave her there for a minute, right? And it's kind of out of sight and we'll see if she stays there, if she gets up and comes in. And if she gets up and come, I'm almost expecting her to get up and come in at this point because it's a hard situation, obviously. Yeah. I have the way of enforcing it, which would be giving my correction, but then the key is then taking her all the way back to that same spot and re-putting her then into that down. Because what happens a lot is like you were kind of describing, it's like we're not expecting it and suddenly she's there and we'll tell her no, right? But then we'll kind of tell her down where she's at. And then she kind of learns she could get up and get 15 feet further, right? And then. You know, we do the same thing, and then she gets up and comes here, and we tell her, no, down. And then she learns she can get six feet further, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it's just kind of tightening up the communication in which how we're enforcing those commands. Yeah, I noticed like, when we tell her to go, like, say, bed. Sure. She'll go, and she'll stay for a minute, and then, like, two minutes later, I'll pick her around the corner, and, like, <laughs> half of her paws out, you know, like, oh, she's yeah. out a little bit, half her body's out. Yeah. And then I'm like, hey, guys. Now, um, are you using, is it like a plush dog bed you're using at yeah, home? Yeah. Okay. So with the plush beds, because they're not as clear of a position as something like this, that's fine, obviously. My expectation with it is just that the front elbows are on the bed. So let's say her front paws, her elbows were on, but like her paws were hanging yeah. off like this and they're like touching the ground. I don't necessarily have an issue with that. Yeah, we'll see some dogs, they'll do like the one paw on the bed yeah. and the rest of their body is <laughs> off of it. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, and then the other side of it too is, is the mentality going into it to be successful at this kind of stuff is of the mindset of we're expecting those mistakes to correct for them as opposed to like all the situations you kind of described are the like suddenly we looked and like we're like caught off guard that she broke that position, you know what I mean? Yeah. So as you're doing those training sessions, like if you're noticing for example, um, bed stays like in duration, let's say your 20 minute bed stay or something like that, you're having an issue with like where you consistently are doing it and then she is consistently after 10 minutes when you're not watching her making a mistake or something like that. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna go into my next couple of sessions doing that, waiting for her to make that mistake so I can catch it the second that she does so we could get past that problem, right? Yeah, like we're finding that like, you know, we catch her, like something happens and they're like, oh, you go to correct, but we don't have the, sure. the thing on us. You know? Yeah, and that's kind of, you know, that's where we get into just the handling side of things. If you, we didn't have it on us because we weren't expecting the mistake, right? Mm -hmm. Where if we're expecting the mistake almost, right, and somebody's kind of on bad duty, right, yeah. then you could address it right away, right? As soon as you see that mistake, it's like, all right, I'm ready, no, nope. you know, and then you could kind of reset her, so. Yeah, when I yeah. wanted to take her out today, uh, just even out to get her to the car, mm -hmm. You know, pull on a leash. Mm -hmm. and like, yeah, yeah. And then she will, she'll listen for a minute and then poof, she'll start to go again and then you're yeah. going back. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of stuff there's like, she's, she's obedient like half of the time. Well, in those situations, right, you said, so you, you got her out of the car and she was pulling, right? And she's still there. She's kind of looking around the corner, but she's still holding it. But same deal, right? I'm ready. I'm waiting for her to make that mistake right there. Yeah. Um, so that, that situation you described, you got out of the car, she's pulling, you said, bear, right? And she stopped for a second and then started pulling again. Were you actually giving corrections when she was pulling or were you just verbally correcting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the thing that we put out, you're not doing it correctly. Because it's like, you know, like this morning, for instance, you know, I usually take her out. Sure. In the morning. And uh, so then she waits for me to open the door, you know, we were, uh, you know, working on that even before she sure. came here. So then she's doing that fine. But once I open the door and I just, you know, I ask her, like, okay, come. Mm -hmm. Then she goes with me, but, uh, but she doesn't, she doesn't walk next to me. She tends sure. to go 
Mm -hmm. So I don't know, you know, like how many times I should correct her. Well, or with me, I mean, like I. Well, it's 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 as ma the the short answer is as many times as we need to, but. Keep in mind, the point of a correction is that it should reduce the likelihood of making that mistake in the future, right? Mm -hmm. So even when we were doing like her send home lesson, for example, there was very few actual corrections she needed because she had, you know, four weeks of consistency of getting them yeah. where she needed to get them, right? So she learned how to avoid them, which is what we want, right? We don't want to have to sit there and be like, click, 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 yeah, click, click. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and I just thought of another sure. thing too, is that, um, there has been a couple of times where I did do a, a correction, yep. and then she like she's like this, mm -hmm. and she won't listen. She won't come. She's like she, you know, oh, she's she stops. She gets afraid, and then sure. she stops listening to anything. So uh, inconsistency with the boundary can create like fear of the unknown. We kind of call it sometimes, where it's like if she doesn't understand the clear expectations, where it's like. 25% of the time she's getting the correction, 50% of the time she's not getting the correction, 25% of the time it's a verbal correction, et cetera, et cetera. That's just an unclear boundary. That's kind of, kind of like the equivalent of like if you had an electric fence, right, and the boundary changed every single day, those dogs would be terrified to even go out into the yard. But with dogs that are on electric fences, they almost never actually need to get the stimulation because it's a consistent boundary, right? So all of this stuff kind of boils down to just the consistency in which we're applying the correction um, and exactly how we're going about reinforcing our commands. And that's what really tightens all this stuff up, right? So that's what we'll work on today is we'll have you guys handle her, obviously go through the motions with some of these commands, we'll test them a little bit. And I just wanna make sure that the way you guys are doing things is right. Cause that, again, that's 90% of it, you know? Uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's only been you know, two weeks, yeah. you guys are still figuring out how to do all this stuff accurately. Yeah. But a lot of it goes into, like I said, the preparation side of things, right? Anticipating the places you're gonna have the problems to be ready to address it. Cause it was funny, like when she got here, she brought her out of the car and she was kind of pulling a little bit, getting inside and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had you before we came up the stairs, get the remote out and you gave her one correction and it was hilarious as soon as you gave that correction she's like okay I'm on my best behavior <laughs> yeah, yeah. and and I could tell before that you're kind of getting a little frustrated because she was yeah. pulling you and stuff like that yeah. so it's a matter of instead of getting frustrated about it just address the problem you know what I mean and predict like okay cool we're coming back to a place that's probably going to be a little exciting for her to be here and she's probably not going to want to listen as much because she wants to see her friends and all that kind of stuff so I'm going to expect those mistakes and I'm just going to be ready right off the rip you know when we get out of the car to give those corrections so that I can just do it one and done right at the beginning and then we're good to go. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so let me see the leash real quick there. So very similar to what I kind of described, right? You were kind of committed, but not super committed with it, right? So what I'm gonna do here, obviously she's resisting a little bit. I'm gonna keep her moving. Come on, let's go. There you go. So not getting in was not an option, right? She's getting in there. Come on, let's go. We gotta get out. There we go, come on. There we go. All right, why don't you push the crate back just a little bit more and I'm gonna do it one more time here. All right, so we're going. There we go. And I did it one time and no much how much less resistance there was the yeah, second time yeah. there, right? Yeah, come on. Let's go. She's like, I don't want to get out now. Come on. Let's go. There we go. All right, so I'm going to have you go ahead and do that next year with her. All right, All right. guess what? It's time to go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. There we go. Look at that. And this is where obviously once we've gotten her in a couple times, you could use a treat obviously to help yeah, her. Yeah. But the key is if she doesn't want to get in, we're still going, we're right? We've got to get in. It's not optional. Yeah, she's a little resistant of coming out as well. I could tell obviously. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. And the first couple times are going to be the hardest, yeah. right? Because she's so used to, again, putting the brakes on works, fighting works, mm -hmm. right? So if she knows in the back of her mind fighting works, if it's starting to not work, in her mind, she's going to go to try to fight harder, yeah. right? Yeah. So she's just got to realize it's just not going to work. So let's do one more. Right. Here, I'll push the crate back a little bit for you. Nice. Uh, nice. Very good. My husband is going to like
So we wanna give her a decent amount of slack. So she's still a little bit tuned out with you, right? And a lot of that is you're still repeating your come command a lot instead of giving your correction. So when we go to do this, right, I'm gonna tell her, Bea, come. I'm gonna start walking. And at this point, anything else that I need to say is just gonna be a correction, because she's in the come command. And I have plenty of slack on this leash where she can make those mistakes <clears throat> so that I can correct for them. Because if I'm constantly holding it short like this, that leash is stopping her from making the mistakes, right? So she's not gonna learn from them. No, come. So right there, for example, because it was loose, she stopped following me, right? And I was able to correct for it then at that point. And just give it one time at the beginning. So just come, start walking. Come. Excellent. And right there where she stopped following you, that would have been no with a correction. A little bit more. Looks good though, looks much better. Nice. And then I think one, and what I want you to do is you're gonna do the same exact thing just off of the leash now. So give that come command and get her to follow you around. Come. And just do that for a little bit. So now when we're off of the leash, this is a great way to practice it as well because you, can, you don't have the leash to like fall back on, to accidentally make those mistakes of holding it too short and her uh, you know, listening only because of that, yeah. right? Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes when the leash is in our hand, it's like our brain just goes to use the leash, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Where when it's not in our hand, the remote is the only thing we have, so it forces us to have better timing with the remote. Very good. And why don't you give her the remote there? And you're gonna do the same thing. So you're gonna give that come command one time and then you're gonna correct if she doesn't do it. <laughs> Did all the hard work. Again, it's not about hoping she does it, it's about ensuring that she does it, right? The deciding factor between her doing it is you following through with it. Okay. Very good. good. All right, so why don't you tell her come, get her to follow you this way. Come. Now just uh, walk, do a quick little loop and then come back in. Are we gonna come back in? Yeah, we're gonna be staying in here. I just wanted to do it outside for a minute see that she could do this even in the real world, right? <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right, you can bring her back in. 
<laughs> and obviously, when it comes to off leash training, work at your comfort level with that, you know. All right, why don't you go ahead and take her over there and put her on the bed. Perfect. A little bit. So you already put her in the bed, obviously. So what we're going to do is we're all going to go over this way and we're going to have her stay there. Yeah. Now, what are you going to do if she gets up? You're going to tell her no and give a correction. And then what are you going to do? <laughs> do you want to ask the audience? <laughs> Yes. You got to take her back and then put her onto the bed. <clears throat> she's still holding it? Perfect. That's all right. So we'll leave her there another minute, obviously. Yeah, so the reset after the correction is very important, right? Because if we just tell her no, right, then we're kind of looking at that as the expectation that she should fix herself, which is not the case, right? Once we've corrected, it's like washed, you know, clean slate, let's try again. Give her one more minute. <laughs> there you go. And then you can pick wherever you want and do a down stay. Now make sure you still tell her down. Oh. Yeah, because if we want her to stay there, we have to verbalize it to her. So go ahead and tell her down. Perfect. And then we're going to say, yeah, we'll go over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It's a great, great place to work it. Yeah, yeah. Cooking is the biggest place people tell me they use that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Why don't you go back to her and just tell her, okay, you could release her. Good job. Very good. Okay. So, couple things to work on here, right? One, getting in the car. No longer optional. She's getting in. Right? That'll get easier, obviously, after a couple of days of doing it. And start adding a treat once she gets in. You know? And if you're noticing she's scared to get out, you get add one in when she gets out as well. That's fine. But the key is she's getting in and she's getting out, obviously. Um, much, much, much more consistent with the corrections, with um, the miscellaneous behavioral issues, chewing things, things like that. And then with your commands, your leash walking in particular, practice it on and off leash, obviously. Again, higher level for it and more consistent where once you give that come command, anything else at that point is a correction, right? And if you guys could just, like I said, over the next like four or five days, be really consistent about that, you're gonna see a huge change in this. Nice, good job. Is this Alfredo? This is Alfredo. You look like Alfredo. I bet you that's, hey, whoa, no. you're a jumper. Hello. All right, you can follow me over this way. Okay. Right up. What's going on with this dude? Well, um, he's picked up a biting habit, unfortunately. Uh-oh. Um, now I'm afraid of And it's uh, unfortunately really sporadic. Okay. Um, it's, it's a little more, or it happens a little bit more uh, frequently when he has food or when he has, you know, food related items. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the second one is when he's asleep. Mm -hmm. um, he will snap very infrequently, but he will snap mm -hmm. uh, and try to get your hand. Um, most of the time he will not growl before he tries to bite. Mm -hmm. um, he'll just go for it. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the biggest, oh, and he gives the, the groomers troubles recently. Okay. Um, when I first adopted him, he was pretty good and didn't give anybody too many problems, but it seems like over the past year, um, he started giving the groomers a little bit more problems and then he started giving me some problems at home with the biting stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like it's, it's, it was time to bring him in and try to get some training done. Yeah. Um, How long have you had him for? I've had him for about a year and a half now. So you've had him for a year and a half and you said he did not have the biting issues initially? No, well, so they warned me about the biting issues. What did they say about it? They said that, you know, he snips a little bit and so they were trying to correct that. And so okay. anytime that he was mouthy, you know, try to correct that. 
Yeah. Um, and so I did that for a while, um, and that didn't seem to, well, it was working for a while, but then he, he bit out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, so the exact situations were, um, I work from home. <clears throat> yep. Um, and so he was sleeping uh, next to my chair, mm -hmm. and I just went to wake him up. Yep. Um, you know, I, I think I touched like his back leg or something like that, and he immediately turned around and got me here and here. Sure, sure. Um, and then the, the time that he got me here, yep. um, I had a chew toy that I gave him. Yeah. Um, I gave it to him, and then I tried to take it away, and then he just a bit. Okay. Um, so I brought that chew toy just as a training exercise. Yeah. All right. Well, a lot of little details. So it's it's. What I'm interested to see is how much of it is, as far as the resource guarding I'm less concerned about, that's fairly straightforward as yeah. far as, you know, learning to work through and stuff, obviously. Mm -hmm. The uh, sleep one, we've seen some dogs with that before on various mm -hmm. intensities of it, obviously. Yep. And what I'm curious is, is it a sleep related thing or is it just certain areas? You know what I mean? Because yeah. you had mentioned obviously the groomer, the legs and stuff like that. You said you touched them on the leg, obviously. I'm thinking it might be a combination of the two. Sure. Because I think the, the last time he bit me here, I touched him on the back of the leg. Yeah. Um, and that's what caused him to snap. So I'm thinking it has something to do with like his knees or his, I, he's definitely sensitive about his feet. Yeah, um, for sure. But he's, he, the back of the leg or like the knees might be another sensitive area. All right, so what we'll do today is I want to take a look at, yeah, we'll take a look at the resource stuff. We'll okay. see how he seems over that. Okay. Um, we will run some handling drills. Has he ever wore a muzzle before? Um, he, only at the groomers probably. I have not put a muzzle on him. Okay, so we'll probably put one on him, make sure that um, obviously he's gonna, okay. gonna be tolerant of it and stuff like that, kind of go from there. All right, so what I'm gonna do first and foremost here, a lot of times we're dealing with resource guarding with dogs. <clears throat> um, the impulsiveness over the resource is the start of the issue, right? So him just being really quick to want to grab that thing. He kind of thinks it's his even when it's out, right? So I'm just going to walk around for a minute and just if he tries to go and jump up and grab it or jump on me or anything like that, I'll just be giving a correction for that. Okay. So. See if he's more interested in everything else. <clears throat> Yeah. Maybe we'll go into his mouth and pick it out. Yeah. And we'll give it up right away. It's just high value things. Yeah. With resource guarding, I would say it's not so much the act of, or it's not so much the fact that when we go to take something from him mm -hmm. that he bites that's the problem. It's the fact that we need to physically remove it in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. So let's take that example you said of if you're walking down the street yep. and there's a miscellaneous object on the ground that you shouldn't have and he goes to get it, a lot of people's instinct is to tell the dog drop it or go grab it out of the mouth. We want to actually be correcting for that okay. so that he learns to relinquish that thing on his own for us, right? You're being polite now, buddy. All right, so I'm gonna drop this thing, give it to him, and then I'm gonna let him chew that thing for a minute here, okay. and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask him to drop it, and I'm gonna see how willing he is to do that. So I guess the last time that he, he bit me over that, he, he took it and then ran away from it and like ran into his cage, and I was like, nobody, come on out. So that was gonna be something I was gonna say is we'll see a lot, I think a lot of the reason why he was hesitant to chew it around me and took a little bit of convincing is because a lot of dogs with resource guarding, because the reason they're guarding is because they have this sense of a threat, we're gonna take it, they try to go away with it somewhere, right? They'll take that resource and they'll go to their bed, they'll go to their crate, they'll go somewhere away from us. Where since he's on a leash, he can't get away from me. So you'll notice like every time I was grabbing that thing, he was very interested in it, right? It's not like he was like, nah, I don't care about it, right? Uh, but he was very apprehensive to start chewing it in the first place, yep. right? So sometimes as we start to work through these things, we start to create routines where I'll give you these resources, but you gotta be near me, you know what I mean? I'm not gonna mess with you, I'm not gonna reinforce that threat and be like petting you or trying to take it constantly or anything like that, but you do need to stay in my presence and get used to engaging with these resources with me near mm -hmm. to help you realize it's not that big of a deal, you know what I mean? Okay, so petting him while he's chewing on that bat. Big no-no. Big, big no, no. Because if you figure, right, like if in his mind you're a threat, right? And in our mind, from the human logic, it's like we're just trying to tell you, hey, it's okay, I'm not trying to take it. But that's us in his mind messing with him. You okay. know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna give him a minute, let him enjoy it obviously for a second, and then like I said, I'm gonna get him to disengage from it. No. 
Now, obviously I told him drop. Yep. I tried to bring him away from it. He went right back for it. So that's what I corrected for, obviously. And he, he does that. Yep. Okay. We'll see that a lot with dogs, like with like balls and stuff. As you tell them drop, they drop it. You got to grab it. They got to snatch that thing back up real quick. Yep. He's got to realize, obviously, until I give it back to you, you're not allowed to have it, obviously. Okay. Let I'll let him have it again. Okay, so what I want to do here is we're just going to test some basic handling with him. So I'm just going to, hey, kind of examine him similar to a vet or a groomer or anything like that. If he's messing with the muzzle, I'm just going to block him from doing so, obviously. Hey. Hey. This is why I like to do the handling first and then the handling with the tools after, because sometimes the dogs will just have an aversion to a specific thing. Yeah. And then I want to see as he, if he gets into a more stressed state of mind like that, if that's where he starts doing biting or anything like that. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the I'm this is why you got sent home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whoa! They said, they said that they, they had two people trying to hold him down. Oh yeah. And then anytime you run into a battle where it's like people are then trying to physically manhandle them down and stuff like that, it just makes it worse. So yeah, a lot of times it's more of a persistence thing than anything, you know? Like I'm not gonna try to actually hold him back or anything like that. I just want him to realize that he could fight all he wants and it just doesn't stop it, you know? And then they essentially learn how to just deal with it. Yeah, little by little. Because again, just like with the resource stuff, he has this sense that something really terrible is gonna happen, right? And it's just a matter of showing him that that's not the case. <laughs> yep. And again, this is what I'm looking to see is how it ramps up like that. <clears throat> and then over time, while we'll see some of this stuff like compound the way you will, which is like, you know, first it's like once every like six months, then it's like once every four months, then it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Yeah. It's because they start to realize very quickly it works, yeah. right? A lot of times that's the point where people will be like, you know what, we're done, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. <clears throat> so the second they learn that that's a, a good behavior to do when they're stressed out, it's like they just start using it. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's when I was just like, oh, uh, this is beyond my Yeah, life. for sure. <laughs> so what I want to see next here is, hey, hey, how he responds to if he's escalating like that, a correction for it if he chills out or persists through it or No. It's meal time. No. Okay. Here you go.
Go work. Come on. Place. Not too bad. Now feeding, a lot of times again, that impulsiveness for the food is the issue. So I don't give like a weight or a sit or a down or anything like that. I make sure I put that bowl down. He's just waiting because he realizes the food is mine. Then once I give it to him, he can have it. And same deal, I'm hanging out next to him the whole time he's eating. Because when a lot of cases, especially if we're used to bowl down, we go do something else. The dog kind of starts to see that it's theirs. And then as we reapproach, that's where the problem is, you know? So hanging out next to them during that feeding process in conjunction with some of the other things helps get them a little bit more comfortable with it. The, the guarding stuff, the grooming stuff, you know, obedience training could use a little bit of pride brushing up on as far as you doing it consistently the right way. Nothing seems very problematic, right? Um, again, the, the sleep stuff is the only questionable thing. That it, it, It's kind of one of those things where it's like, as we start working through things, we see if that just kind of dissipates on its own. Yep. But you have to be very, very, very keenly aware of the fact that like if he's snoozing, don't touch him right now. You know what I mean? Just because obviously you can't, like, you can't afford another bite again, obviously. Yep. If you need to wake him up or something, you know, obviously just use something. Yeah. <laughs> Poke I, him with something or whatever. Like, I usually say like, Alfredo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he perks off and then I'm like, okay, come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and again, that's not the solution from the standpoint of, right. you know, we want to make sure that if you do touch him while he's sleeping, like he's not going to turn and bite you in something. Uh, but we want to make sure that, you know, as or we want to, I should say, we want to see as we start working through all of these other issues, mm -hmm. how much of his just general snarkiness, we'll call it, just kind of dissipates on his own. You know, a lot of times it's like kind of the waterfall effect of like we address this and it kind of solves this a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then we fully solve that and it solves this a little bit and, and you kind of work your way down that way, yep. right? So that's kind of what I'm seeing with him. He seems like, I mean, he clearly knows stuff, right? He yeah. listened pretty fine. Like he's clearly had a good foundation of training on him. So that's a very yep. positive thing because we don't need to do a lot with him from that standpoint. Yep. Really, we need to focus on you and you understanding all of this stuff. And then yep. we need to focus on putting in place really clear protocols for how we're giving resources, how we're taking resources, things like that. Mm -hmm. So we could reduce some of that anxiety in his head of like not knowing what to expect around the resources, mm -hmm. which is what's causing him to guard them in the first place. Yep. Does that make sense? That makes kind of sense.